60th session of the Menno Simons Lectures here at Bethel College. I'm John Thiessen, archivist and co-director of libraries here and current chair of the committee that puts together this lecture series. The Menno Simons Lecture Series began in 1953 with Roland Bainton as lecturer, so it's now almost half as old as the college itself and it is funded by an endowment provided by the Kaufman and Yankee families, as you can read in, uh, in your printed brochure. Our focus this year is the history of Bethel College, uh, another event in connection with the college's 125th anniversary. And our speaker has been present for about 40% of that college history. Keith Sprunger was one of the most prominent faculty members for nearly 40 years of Bethel students starting in 1963. Uh, students who fondly remember his History of Civ course, which was often taught in this very room, and with his particular sense of humor and repertoire of sweeping historical gestures. And uh, many students will also remember several of the other classic courses, Renaissance and Reformation, uh, English history, Greece and Rome, oral history projects, and so on. He also has a, a special connection to the lecture series in that he wrote a brief history of the series for its uh, 50th uh, sessions back in 2002. And we have a few copies of that publication available if you're interested. Keith's latest project, of course, is the new history of Bethel College. And there are copies of the book available for sale out in the, in the lobby at the table there. In this lecture series tonight and uh, the next two days, we'll hear a few more specific spotlights on several themes in the college's history. Tonight on the uh, 19th century origins of the college. So please welcome Keith Sprunger as our lecturer this evening. Thank you, John, and good evening. He reminded me that I am Professor 40%. <laughs> when this uh, series started in 1953 with Roland Bainton, he was asked to give and did indeed present eight lectures over four days, plus meet in several classes, so that he gave probably 10 or 11 lectures during that time. I want to thank the lecture committee for toning that down quite a little bit <laughs> and recognizing that great Mennonite principle that you get more with less. Uh, the topic tonight, Bethel, the Light in the West, the 19th century origins of the college. Now let's start in June of 1887, when David Gores and Bernard Warkentine, two of the moving forces in establishing Bethel College, made a trip to Lindsburg, north of here by train, in order to visit and be present at Bethany College's commencement services and dedication of their new building. <coughs> Bethany College, splendid new six-story building. They were looking, Warkentine and Gores were looking for ideas about how to start a college. Bethany was already a going concern, having been established in 1881 and this was six years earlier and the two returned and as the newspaper said they returned delighted with all they had heard and saw. What were these special delights that they discovered at Lindsborg and about starting a college? Well delight number one was that a college needs publicity and campus programming. The special campus programs which Bethany put on, combining scholastic, musical, literary, and business activities, were quite outstanding. These attracted crowds, special trains brought in uh, people, supporters from a distance, and there was a special offering 
with the selling of lots for building houses around the college and just for general donations. It brought in about $25,000 on that weekend. And best of all, Bethany got some tremendous advertising, advertising incalculable in currency. A second delight or a second point that discovered was the importance of having a good and great central building for your college. The new main building dedicated at this ceremony was a jewel to behold. It was six stories of magnificence. A few weeks before, a delegation of state legislators had been traveling through the state and they came through Lindsburg by night. And as the, as the train came through, they saw this great building illuminated from turret to foundation stone. It was Bethany College and one representative who came from Republic County later reported that it was a great surprise to find that beautiful spectacle. It was a revelation that such an institution existed. The point was noted, a great building allows you to make a great impression. And point number three that they discovered that Bethany was doing in a successful way was to build a broad and inclusive mission and constituency. Bethany's success in rallying, rallying its entire community in support of the college was notable. Bethany's announced mission was to be a service to Swedish immigrants and also to those of purely American lineage. According to, Linz, according to the newspaper account at Lindsberg may be seen the results of Scandinavian patience and energy under what may be called American conditions. It is the genius of the North with the advantages of transplantation. The aim of this school, the article went on to say, is to, pres is to preserve the faith and sentiment and culture of the fatherland imparting therewith the knowledge necessary to the American citizens. Here are joined in the matter of instruction what is best in two free peoples. The school situated as it is in one of the largest communities of Swedish Americans in the West commands their united support and also numbers among its students many of purely American lineage. This was an interesting point. The Swedes had built a college for Swedes, but they reached out and said, and this will be for all, uh, all of you of American background as well. Gores and Warkentin returned, brimming with ideas and inspiration. Again, according to the newspaper account, Bethany was an interesting experience for Gores and Warkentin as they are deeply interested in the Bethel College of North America, which is to be established at Newton. We're just in June of 1887. All we have is the charter so far, nothing else. They were interested in what they found there, and it is proposed to be, this Mennonite school is proposed to be for the Mennonite body what Bethany is for the Swedish Lutherans, a school in which nationality and a common religion are actors. So what Bethel would need, if we followed through on this item, would be we need to have good campus program with music and, and uh, speeches and things that draw in the crowds. We need to have a fine building. And we need a plan that will combine the resources, in this case, of the German language Mennonites, plus the resources and support of the local American community. The trip to Lindsberg by Gores and Warkending pretty much seemed to foretell the plan and strategy that would shortly launch Bethel College. This is not to say that this was the only inspiration. We don't want to give all of the credit to the Lutherans for what we've accomplished here <laughs> at Bethel. But I think, this, I think this visit probably was very instructive because here were people who had discovered how to make a successful college and this was the combination of things that worked for them. And uh, that's what Bethel, I think, tried to accomplish as well. Here's a quick framework of early college history. 1887, Bethel Charter. 1888, the cornerstone laying of the building. 1893, building completed and classes were begun. 
Now, at the, at the beginning of this enterprise, Bethel had high hopes. And I want to turn now to a quotation from C.H. Wadle, who became the first president of Bethel College. Wadle pronounced that Bethel College had a grand future, and that was to become the towering citadel of Mennonite erudition in America. Although our resources may be small, we will offer a tremendous institution of expert knowledge so that students and friends will say, at Bethel, we got more than we expected. Have we all said that? That was the promise. We will, we will give you more than you expected. Thus was born Bethel College with these brave words and these audacious dreams. And he was no doubt thinking that if other denominations could do it, Bethel and the Mennonites could also accomplish this. And so Bethel College came about, the first Mennonite liberal arts college in America, and in fact, the first Mennonite school of this kind anywhere in the entire world, and for a considerable time, the one with the largest enrollment of any Mennonite institution. But there was a, there was a problem. The place that they proposed to do this was in Kansas. Now, some of us believe that Kansas suffers from the stereotype of being a dull place. Some call it flyover country, the sort of place that you want to avoid if possible, or if you have to come across it in, on Route 70, that you rush through it as quickly as possible with the fewest, fewest stops that are uh, eligible to you. Indeed, when I moved here to, from Indiana in 1963, my grandfather, 94 years old, said, I'm worried about you going out to Kansas. I knew people that went out to Kansas back in the old days, and they all went broke, and they all had to come home and start over again. Country on the edge of things. The founders of Bethel College, however, did not see Kansas or their location in that way. They did not intend to be merely fringe people. No, they were people of the center, although far from the heartland of Europe and the heartland of Mennonitism, they were established a towering, this towering citadel, uh, this tremendous institution. And tonight, we want to look uh, into how Bethel pioneers and those founders went about trying to achieve this national and even international pan-Mennonite transatlantic endeavor. Now, Bethel was a joint college town enterprise. Mennonites arrived here in this western frontier in the 1870s. Not so long ago, this was the land of the Plains Indians, the bison, the cowboys, and the Chisholm Trail. And millions of longhorn cattle uh, rambled through this area uh, uh, over several years, and in, and in fact, over this various place where we are now. And had this been that 125 years ago, we might expect to see a, a herd of cattle come down this aisle here on their way, on their way south, to, uh, on their way north. We want to send them northward up to the, up to the railroad. So this, this, was, this was an area that was um, on the frontier, uh, economically viable because of the cattle trade, the promise of agriculture, but a rough and, and woolly wild town with plenty of saloons and gun-toting cowboys and dance hall beauties, just like in the Western movies. In fact, the famous Buffalo Bill Cody declared this about Newton. The toughest, cussedest Wild West town I ever knew was Newton, Kansas in the early days. It had a population mostly of whiskey sellers, gamblers, and thieves. Now, the civilizing element, I'm glad to report, went out, and this became a settled and respectable little city. When Kansas Mennonites began talking about a new liberal arts college, they found support from Newton boosters and business people who teamed up with that idea. Bethel thus was a joint Mennonite-Newton enterprise. The two parties worked together for, to produce what they called a first-class college. The college charter of incorporation of 1887 had 33 signers. 30 were Mennonites, three were other citizens of Newton. Presbyterians and Methodists. The Newton representatives were Charles R. McLean, James 
M. Ragsdale, and Arthur B. Gilbert. These three were prominent citizens of Newton, bankers and entrepreneurs, sort of the cream of the cream of the Newton elite business society. And these three were then also named to Bethel's first board of directors. The charter had established this enterprise here as an independent corporation called the Bethel College Corporation. And it was to build and maintain the college, which was to be a Mennonite college, but not owned by the Mennonite denomination as such. The charter also specified that to be a member of the corporation or any of its bodies, one must be a Mennonite. Membership, Mennonite membership was, necess was a necessity for the corporation or the board of directors. However, these strict Mennonite requirements were not applied for the first year, as can be seen by the role of these Newtonian business people that were active. Something else that Newton offered beside these prominent business supporters was the promise of, of a good financial support. There was promise of $100,000, and this was a very substantial amount for that time. Some of it in cash, but much of it in land. Now, the land was rather vastly overvalued, uh, and not nearly that amount was ever realized from it. In fact, most of the money that was promised of that $100,000 never came in. I'll say more about that. When they tried to sell the lots, they found few buyers, and when people made offers, they were what I guess we'd call low-ball offers on it, not in the league that had been promised. But there had been promise of financial support, and there was some financial support. Newtonians embraced the new Mennonite College as Newton's own. The Newton newspaper, called the Newton Republican, wrote in 1888, we speak of Bethel as our college. Really, it is to be the pride of a great church throughout the limits of the North American continent and to be the pride of our community. There was much talk about Mennonites and Newtonians working together harmoniously for a great future. A little storm blew up when the college architects, Proudfoot and Bird, in 1891, proposed that since things were not completed here, they had a special offer for the, for the Bethel people. They had a building that they had built for Fairmount University in Wichita, but that was not really a going enterprise. And they said, that building, which became eventually Wichita State University, is available and the city of Wichita is offering that to you for $10,000, ready to go, along with 10 acres of prime land. This would have been, of course, a great bargain. In that case, Bethel would have been Bethel of Wichita. This offer greatly alarmed the Newtonians, who were, who were enraged at this brazen deal. In fact, the Newton newspaper spoke up with alarm. What was this but a scheme to steal our Mennonite college? Hands off our college. Now at the center of the new campus was to be a monumental building, which we call today the Ad Building or the main building. A couple of years ago, the State Historic Preservation Conference met on our campus and asked some questions like this. Where are your examples of distinctive Mennonite architecture? What is distinctive Mennonite architecture? Is this building an example of Mennonite? And they were thinking particularly of our administration building. Certainly this building is not in the style of the simple house church tradition, like the Germantown Mennonite Church at Philadelphia, 1770, or the hidden church tradition of Holland. The Mennonite immigrants to this area, however, had memories of a grander Mennonite style beginning to emerge in their Russian homeland, and they also had images of what people were doing like at Lindsberg and the, around there. And so they aimed for something else not tied to the Mennonite tradition, but something that would reach into a new dimension of greatness. If Bethel was to be great, then it must have a great building. As good as the ones that other colleges have, and perhaps even better, at least as much as our money will allow us. The college officials took these steps. 
They hired architects Willis Proudfoot and George Washington Bird of Wichita, rising stars in the architectural world, and chose a style known today as Richardsonian Romanesque as the style which they would have. This is a neo-medieval castle-like style, and with that in mind, architects, plans, designs, they began to build. The original plans called for a more gigantic structure. There would have been four stories plus a rather high tower. This extra feature, however, had to be cut out because of Mennonite frugality and lack of money. Proudfoot and Bird did a lot of work in Wichita. Some of the nice examples of that would be the Friends University building, the historical museum uh, in the center across from Century Two, and, and uh, other fine buildings. Architectural historians call the work of Proudfoot and Bird monumental and productive of conspicuous landmarks. So we have a Mennonite building that is now conspicuous and monumental here in Newton. Was this a Mennonite building? Perhaps not, but the Bethel founders loved it. At the cornerstone laying ceremony in 1888, there was great celebration. Everybody spoke uh, with uh, gratefulness that they were underway with this building, and in 1893, great rejoicing that they had now raised it up and it was usable. The Wichita Eagle reported at the cornerstone laying event the walls of Bethel College are rising heavenward. Now this had hints, I suppose, of Mennonite presumption, perhaps even hubris. Rising heavenward, rising to heaven. The Tower of Bethel going upward like that to heaven. Did anyone think of that earlier Tower of Babel and how that had ended? The, the momentum for building after that great start stalled and the money ran out. And here we see this photo of the ghost-like shell of a building. Kansas at this point went into depression and Newton was also in that depression. The new, local newspapers referred to, referred to it as the Newton Panic. Many businesses went into the soup and among the bankrupted Newtonians were several of the businessmen who had supported Bethel and promised a $100,000 fund. They were no longer able to provide the fund. In fact, they needed aid themselves. How bitter it must have been for Gores and Warkentin to view this monument to real Mennonite stupidity. Or some would say that a better translation would be Mennonite foolishness. Where is the origin of this Mennonite stupidity story? P.J. Whale in his famous History of Bethel College, you know, the marine, maroon book that we all have, printed this story and said some called it this monument to Mennonite stupidity. Unfortunately, he did not give a source for that idea. And I wondered, where did that story come from? I found at least one account of this in, uh, at, at, from a later uh, writings about Gores and it went something like this, that the board was in consternation in 1890, presiding over an unfinished building rather than a functioning college. There was gloom and more gloom. At a crucial point of the board, Reverend Heinrich Rickert spoke up and said, brethren, if we leave this building uncompleted, then we are erecting for our posterity a monument of genuine Mennonite Dummheit. Now, I never saw this phrase or epithet used in Newton newspapers at the time, nor did I ever see it printed out anywhere else at the time. So it makes me wonder whether this is a story that comes just out of a kind of folklore. But it does make a good story, doesn't it? That they were at the, they were at the edge of catastrophe, a fiscal catastrophe, and survived it. Well, the building was, in due time, by 1893, completed. School opened in September of 1893. And it was conspicuous, glorious, gloriously so. 
The Newton newspaper reported that it stood out like a beacon, a light on the prairie. It is pure white and can be seen for miles. Here it is, the light in the west. During this depression, Proudfoot and Bird left town and went out west looking for better um, uh, pickings and uh, next went to Salt Lake City where they did work for the Mormons who apparently had more money and they were able to build some conspicuous monuments out in Salt Lake City. This Bethel building with its high style <coughs> architecture was the grandest and most magnificent structure produced by Mennonites anywhere in the world up to that time <coughs> and perhaps given the circumstances the finest ever. Architect Rudy P. Friesen of Winnipeg has written, buildings are an expression of the people who build them, a reflection of their intentions, aesthetic shared values, material resources, and life conditions. If so, the Bethel College building gives us much to ponder about Mennonites who established colleges, their goals and aspirations, and how they express them in stone and structure. I'd like to add another note about this building, something I discovered rather recently. While well, going through some of the um, records of J.H. Langenwalder, who was president of Bethel, 1910-1911. And he noted that the Bethel building today has uh, six chimneys on, I don't know how many are functioning, but there are six chimneys, two on each side and two at the back. But there used to be eight. And this is what Langenwalder said. There were no restrooms in the main building in 1910. There were, however, two very large chimneys which had been used for the original hot air furnace, but no longer were of use. It was decided to take them down and to use the 22,000 bricks in these chimneys as a foundation for the music hall, which is being established behind the ad building, and for other purposes. Now, who would do the work of taking down these chimneys? The taking down of these, of these, of these brick chimneys was an event in the lives of the student body. They worked for days cleaning them, sort of like having them on the rock pile, is that right? And after the removal of this brick, the vacant spaces created in the basement of the administration building were turned into two restrooms. I imagine these are the two that we still have there. And from the look of them, they haven't changed a great deal in this last <laughs> hundred years. I've had that thought at times. Just a mention of the next building that, that Bethel constructed, the next major building, which was the women's dormitory, uh, later known as Carnegie Hall because it was built with Carnegie and with Carnegie money. I just thought we'd notice that this desire for the castellated building was still there when we went to, this was a much cheaper one, but notice the castellated effect and even the name that it came to have, uh, especially that upper part, Irish Castle. In fact, someone, uh, 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 an alumnus, from uh, years ago, just very recently, he told me, yeah, there, there, there were these girls that lived over an Irish castle. And I think he was referring to the whole structure. So Bethel, in the early days, intended to have castles and fortresses to protect the learning and to protect the girls, I guess. Now, one of the things that a college would have to have would be a stated uh, mission and goal. And Bethel originally had a very broad mission and aim to serve widely. Bethel, in the 19th century, stepped forward and said it wanted to give leadership to the Mennonite world, to be the citadel of Mennonite learning, and this, of course, was a self-appointed role. As the school opened with all of its fanfare and fancy new building, the Wichita Eagle again had a prediction. This place will become for Mennonite the religious and educational Mecca. Now the primary mission or aim was to provide education for the Kansas and Western Mennonite population. And then secondarily, for the Newton Americans 
and for young men and young women um, of whatever background. But uh, these, these were the original goals. We want to serve the Mennonite population. We want to serve the, the Newton and Kansas population. This was a part of that goal. And in fact, the first report of the uh, board of directors talked about the open doors that they intended to have. Yet in spite of these open doors, the Mennonite aspect of it was always very, very strong. And uh, the student body was quite heavily Mennonite and the faculty. If, so, uh, if qualified Mennonites could be found, it was always the desired group. When qualified Mennonites could be found, they had the teaching jobs. In the year 1900, the college dismissed Homer Webster, a Quaker, the teacher of mathematics and science, in spite of very good work in his teaching. This was so that a Mennonite could be hired in his place. But there was also a wider mission, and that was to serve all American Mennonites and even European Mennonites. The Bethel founders made quite a point of, being, uh, of stating that, they, that this was the only Mennonite liberal arts, liberal arts college in existence. David Gores, the unstoppable gave, uh, David Gores, canvassed Mennonites all across the country, going to the East Coast, and eventually even to Germany and Russia, for money and students for Bethel. He would say, Bethel is the Mennonite college, and it deserves the support of all Mennonites wherever they are. Gars was so relentless in his fundraising that he received the nickname, the beggar from Bethel. <laughs> he was always at the door. In the first generation of American General Conference Mennonite preachers, teachers, and missionary, people, the majority were trained at Bethel. Indian missionary P.A. or Peter A. Penner testified that it was at Bethel that he received his call to be a missionary and where he learned to appreciate Menno Simons and not to be ashamed of his Mennonitism. At Bethel, he said, I learned that it is an honor to be a Mennonite. In the foreign realm, there was a strong Russian connection. President Waitle and business manager David Gores avidly worked at the connection with Russia, these two distant areas, the eastern frontier of Europe and now the western frontier of Europe. They were natives of Russia and cultivated their relatives and contacts back in the old country. Whenever Gores or Wedel would make a trip back to the Mennonite settlements of Russia, they would return reporting that they found a lively interest for our school in Russia. Gifts and students followed. In 1896, the General Conference of Russian Mennonites meeting in, the, in that country resolved at the conference that in future, we will send students to Bethel College in America for missionary training. Students from Russia began arriving in 1897 The first to come were Johann F. Croker and Jacob Gerbrandt. And in the first decade of the school, students from Russia were common. The Mennonites brought an exotic flavor to the college. Sometimes on special occasions, they would dress in what was called native clothes and sing songs in Russian. Here's a photo of the class of 1899. And at the far right, is Johann Croker, looking rather Russian with that furious beard. A graduate of the program, representing Russia. He was from Gnadenfeld, and after graduation, teamed up with P.A. Penner to become the, that first mission station of the Mennonite missionaries in India. The school paper School and College Journal, edited by Gores, was pan-Mennonite and international. Subscriptions were available in three currencies. You could pay in American funds, 25 cents. If you wanted the paper sent to Germany, one mark, 50 pfennig, and in Russia, 75 kopecken. In 1897, there were 90 subscribers in Russia. 
Bethel did not intend to be just a local institution. We're, we're, we're that towering citadel. We're, we're, we're meeting all the needs, or try to. There was also a Dutch connection, which I don't have time to go into with any detail tonight. But President C.H. Whale developed relations with the Amsterdam Mennonite Seminary and with uh, other Dutch Mennonites. In, a, in his trip of 1898, he visited the seminary and also visited the new Meadow Simons Monument in Friesland. And he thought in his report that he was likely the first Mennonite to have come there to visit the Mennonite Monument. Many of us have probably been there since, but he was probably the first. Scaling down the vision. <coughs> After a decade or so, we see Bethel's national and international light beginning to dim a little. The vision had to narrow and refocus, and this was for several reasons. One was the death of, uh, of David Gores and President C.H. Wadle, one in 1910 and the other in 1914. They were the ones that had all these European connections, and when they died, there was no one else who had that kind of cachet and that kind of connection. Also, the Russian uh, frontier closed off due to the War of 1914 and the subsequent Russian Revolution, which provided more barriers. Within, also, within a very few years, the claim of being the only Mennonite college <coughs> was, uh, was defunct. By 1610, six additional Mennonite colleges had, had, had been established in Canada, the Gretna Mennonite uh, Institution, and in the United States, Goshen, Bluffton, Freeman Junior College, and two more here in Kansas. Hills, uh, Tabor at Hillsboro, 25 miles away, and Hes Heston College at Heston, just seven miles away. Heston belonged to the old Mennonite group, but had little confidence that a Bethel education would serve their particular group. T.M. Erb of Heston opined that it was very unlikely that a Bethel education would produce graduates that would be simple, plain, and humble in the old Mennonite way. It would be necessary to have their own school. So history has given us a verdict. No one American Mennonite college or institution can for long claim the central role of the Mennonite world. It has to be a shared gift and responsibility. The Newton connection also weakened considerably that relationship which had been so vivid in 1887 now dimmed somewhat again. The most obvious reason was the Mennoizing of Bethel. On the evening of the cornerstone laying ceremony, October 12, 1888, the Bethel Corporation held its first official meeting at First Mennonite Church in Newton. And at this point, the Mennonite provisions of the charter were strictly enforced and those people that were Newtonians but not Mennonites were removed from the board and even from the corporation. The changing of the charter so that people other than Mennonites would be able once again to join was long in coming. It last, uh, this uh, this Mennonizing lasted for about 75 years and it was not until 1962 that the first Newtonians or others were once again appointed to the board and that first board member from the new group was Judge Sam Storm. Some of you may remember him, a prominent Newton citizen. And having come to the board, he immediately was able to bring special skills and knowledge. Two things, for example, very soon after he came to the board, there was a theft of typewriters uh, from some of the offices at Newton. Storm was immediately able to advise who some of the local lowlife and scum and likely thieves would be and that they should be checked out. <laughs> also, we, we have to note that the financial support for Newton had not come in as it had hoped and that probably reduced somewhat its role in the college. The big money, the $100,000 promise, was mostly never paid. Only a little cash and considerable unusable land came in. 
Bethel received about $7,600 from cash or sale of land out of the $100,000. In a fund drive of 1902, Warkentine and his committee put out a college brochure that appealed to Newton donors and said this. Said this the, the money that was promised was not paid. May we now come before the people of Newton once more on behalf of our cause. And in, in, that's polite language for saying, please pay up. Newton's con contribution to Bethel through the years has been significant and substantial, but perhaps not quite as large financially as had been hoped for. At the crossroads. In 1935, under the ingenious direction of Willis Rich, Bethel's director of public relations, the college launched a new advertising concept, Bethel at the Crossroads of America. Bethel widely advertised itself as a place where good friends meet at the crossroads of a nation and as the college at the crossroads of America. This boldly revived that original vision of Bethel Bethel, it was said, Bethel of Kansas, is wonderfully situated at the intersection of the great national highways, US 50 and US Route 81. How much more central could you get? Here's an advertising cartoon from that campaign, 1936, that makes the point in picture form of Bethel at the crossroads everything converging on Bethel. We don't know for sure who the artist of this work was, but perhaps Lena Waltner, the art teacher of the time. The ancient Romans had a saying, all roads lead to Rome. Bethel has now revised that saying. Roads don't lead to Rome, all roads lead to Bethel. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. We can take some time now for questions and comments. Mark has a handheld mic to bring around to people who would have questions to ask and comments to make. How do you account for the Mennonites in eastern United States and Pennsylvania particularly uh, not making a college in that area? Well, <clears throat> we, had, we had colleges in Ohio, Indiana, uh, South Dakota, up in Canada, but uh, not until uh, later did we have one in, uh, in Virginia, and I think 1917, Eastern Mennonite College, but none, none there in Pennsylvania. I don't really know the answer for that. Was it because there was less desire for education there? I'm not sure that I'd want to make that claim. Um, the, uh, the Eastern District of the General Conference eventually supported Bluffton College to some degree. Um, in more recent times, Messiah College has made a strong appeal to draw in Mennonites and by naming Rodney Sawatsky, a Mennonite to the presidency, was able to, uh, to gain a kind of support there. But I don't have the answer. David, David Hobbard had asked, why did, the, why, did they not why did they not form their own college? I'm glad they didn't. I think we have more Mennonite colleges in America than we already need. But it wouldn't have been surprising if they had established one. Maybe someone here has an idea who knows that Eastern scene better than I do as to why in that concentration of Mennonites, a college did not emerge. Uh, 
Thanks, Keith. Uh, just a question on, in the early days. Uh, was there, did, did you come across any evidence of the sort of schisms within the Mennonites who were at Bethel College? Certainly, we, at least some of us were aware of those. My, uh, my mother came from Gossel and my father came from Mound Ridge and there was some, what was it called? Uh, Ed, my cousin was saying Turkey Creek or something and people said, people on one side or the other shouldn't, shouldn't associate with each other. They're all Mennonites, but yeah. some came from Russia, some came from Germany and so forth. Yes, I, I, did, I did find reports that the Schweitzers, the, the people of Swiss background, tended to, tended to congregate together and the people of low German background, say these, the, the Gossel people, uh, tended, to, <coughs> tended to keep together. And there was, there was uh, some rivalry among them. In uh, E.G. Kaufman's um, interviews and his writings, he talks about those, those kind of rivalries. And woe be to any Schweitz or anybody from Hopefield that would date one of these low Germans. The next day they would be, they would be thrown into the well or into the horse trough to teach them a lesson. So there, 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 was that, there was that kind of rivalry there uh, among the young people that must have reflected a much uh, wider rivalry of the uh, congregations. And um, I think, <clears throat> oh, that was in the early days. I didn't find that uh, very strong when we got, let's say, up by the 1940s and beyond. I think by that time it was very much a, a kind of a... Uh, a declining feature. Maybe people were aware of it, but it wouldn't have been uh, the means of being thrown into the into the creek or or paddled or something like that. Now there were there were certainly rival rivalries in terms of support of Bethel College, and not all of the Western District or Kansas Conf Western District Conference really supported Bethel. Those who had been strong supporters of the Halstead Seminary were all, were very disappointed. That, that Bethel uh, was started and that caused the, the decline, eventually the ruin. And they say the Halstead supporters were re really quite angry. Uh, and even uh, Saul Gores, who was a Halstead person himself, as a traitor, and, and some of them promised that we're going to get to you. Uh, that there, there, there's some of that, and, and C.H. Wadle once, once confessed to uh, uh, to Langenwalter, he said, you're a pastor of a church, how, how I wish I could be a pastor of just one church, trying to try to hold all these people together to support the college, it wears me out. And he had an early death too, as a matter of fact, he died before age 50. I don't know, many of you are graduates of Bethel, I don't know at what point you felt that's, that difference between the the, the, the Schweitzer and the low German thing, how keen that was in your particular era. I do believe, though, that Bethel served to be a unifying, unifying force in bringing these uh, churches and these different ethnic groups together. E.G. Coffin, President Coffin, used to say there are 11 different groups there, and he knew every one of them, and his point was to somehow or other blend them together so that they could be supporters. Uh, not all of them became supporters, but that was the goal that he had, and I think Bethel did play a large role in that, um, creating a more harmonious Mennonite uh, group here uh, west of the Mississippi. I speak as an outsider. Would you comment on the uh, Bethel Academy and uh, what contribution it made, and uh, where was it housed? Well, the, um, you know, the, the college, when I mean, it started in 1893, was mainly a, just a glorified um, uh, junior high and high school. Uh, there were no college courses at all offered in 1893. And so the whole thing was kind of an academy, and even some of it was, el was elementary uh, level education. Gradually, that, that lower level type of education was reduced and college classes were incorporated so that by 1912 you had, we were able to offer Bachelor of Arts degrees and then you could separate out those who were only studying at the high school level and that became then a more distinct group known as the Academy. So it took several years for that to sort of pull apart. 
for that. The academy then continued. So, so it was housed right, right in these same buildings. It was a part of the same package. But after 1912, the, the academy became a more distinct group. These are people that are at high school level. Here are the people that are at college level. And the hope was that they would, the, the high school people, the academy people would cross over. The academy was closed down uh, in, in 1927. That was, the end, that was the end of the academy then uh, because of uh, uh, reduced, um, I guess there weren't enough resources to cover all of these bases anymore. Uh, during World War II, the academy was briefly uh, revived and called the, the, what was it called? The Bethel Christian Academy, I think it was, 1944, 45, maybe 46. And at that time, it was housed mainly in Gossel Hall because so many of the men had been drafted and there was plenty of space and they used Gossel Hall for that second phase of the academy. Now, P.J. Wadel makes the claim in his book that the academy, that second academy was short-lived, but he said that was the seed of, uh, of, uh, of the academy, at the Berean Academy and the Central Academy, uh, Central Christian Academy in Hutchinson. So he felt that Bethel had had a kind of influence upon academy education. I think the rise of the high schools and the improvement of the high schools in the community made it less necessary for, for Mennonites to have a special school. They were more at home with the schools, public schools that they had in their communities, and uh, therefore there was simply a drop off of that particular interest. Interestingly, though, the Heston Academy survived up into, well into the 60s and for a time, I think, was the only high school that they had in Heston at all. So there, the Heston people maintained their academy much more successfully than, the, than uh, Bethel did. Do we have any people here tonight who attended the Bethel Academy? Oh, yes. You have the mark. Yes, good. Your uh, <laughs> coverage or comparison between Lindsberg, uh, the Swedish Lutherans, and Bethany College, uh, on the one hand, as kind of an inspiration for uh, German-speaking Mennonites. You have German Mennonites and Swedish Lutherans. Um, why is it that the uh, Bethany became the home of the Swedes but Bethel did not become the home of the Germans. That is, the, the uh, national identity at Bethany College seems stronger than the national identity at, at Bethel. Was that, was that from the beginning, or did that happen as a result of World War or something? Well, I would guess the war had a, quite an effort. You know, originally, Bethel made a point that at our college you will receive, we offer an excellent German education. Although I think from the very beginning there were more classes in English than there were in German. But that was one of the things they mentioned, that we have, we have faculty who really know German. And if you want a German a classical German education, we can offer that. Um, I, I think the desire for that, it was, it was, it was partly, I think, the, the audience, the clients weren't there. Uh, that, was o that was okay for the first decade or so, but once you got into the 20th century, the young people really didn't want a German education. They wanted an English education, and um, I think that tended to uh, diminish the German culture in general. And of course, the war, World War I and World War II, made all things German quite suspect. But I, 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 just think that, I just think that the young Mennonites didn't want it, and that caused it to, to evaporate. Now, whether the, whether the Swedes at Lutheran wanted that Lutheranism, I don't know. At least it, was not, it didn't have the problem of being the enemy in wartime. Just, just uh, a thought here. I want to say that my, my this is Thelma Bartell, I wanted to say that my, my mother and my father graduated from the Bethel Academy when it was first opened in, in the early times. And I still have their diplomas. 
Well, it, ser it served a real purpose for people that had not uh, gone very, you know, high in their education. It, it brought them up and, and uh, I think uh, served very well. Has Bethel always been the most liberal of the Mennonite schools? Uh, in my grandfather's diary of the time that he was at Bethel from 1910 to 1913 when he graduated, in one entry there was that he spent the afternoon reading Charles, uh, name went away, uh, Origin of Species. Charles Darwin. Dickens. Darwin. 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 Yeah, Charles, Charles Darwin. Darwin. Origin of Species. Now, I don't think you could read that whole thing in an afternoon, but well, uh, the, it was obviously part of the curriculum. The, the beauty of Darwin's um, Origin of Species is there is about a 30-page summary at the end, which summarizes it all. And if you read that, you could sound pretty knowledgeable about Darwin. Um, well, that, that, that would have been... Um, that that would have, that would have been a problem at Bethel, and and at other uh, Mennonite schools, the um, the role of science the the role of science was a was an issue, and some people who were not so sure about higher education in general were less sure even of of this science, this higher scientific knowledge, and I know that um, P J Wadel, who was a science teacher, talked about how much, how much complaint there was about science and what they were doing. And when they were building the new science hall that was dedicated in 1925, it was, up, it was uphill going because there were many supporters of the college that didn't want to support that kind of a building. So I, I don't think we should believe that all the classes were filled with uh, Darwinian teachers. And uh, you know, the, some of the students were, and I think some of the faculty indeed were, were quite um, uh, expansive in their thinking. I, I agree with that. But um, during the teens, several of those more progressive teachers were forced out, and, and uh, that uh, way, that fresh wave of thinking was, um, was cut off at that point. Several, several of the young teachers who had done uh, very high quality graduate work. Uh, felt Bethel was no longer um, friendly to them and that uh, there was a kind of a cloud of orthodoxy coming over the college. So it, it, it came and went there as, as far as whether Bethel was liberal. Now comparing that with other schools, I don't know that I want to venture into that particular, <laughs> venture into that particular topic or not, but um, I, it's encouraging that students were reading on their own. I think that's a good idea. I'm all for that. <laughs> so. Do you have any comments on the relationship of uh, the founding of Grace Bible Institute and its relationship to Bethel? Well, the first president of, of um, Grace Bible Institute was a Bethel graduate. C.H. Sukow. So, in, in a sense, when we, ca we talk about our planting the seeds, uh, we had a role. I do talk about that to some degree in, in the book itself. And um, that, um, that, that, that was a sign of people who felt that Bethel had become too liberal and that all of the general conference schools were in that category, too liberal and there needed to be a more orthodox Mennonite school. I think that was the drive behind uh, the founding of Grace Bible Institute. And um, that, that detracted from, uh, from Bethel's role in, in terms of rallying the whole Mennonite constituency by having that split within it. I came across kind of an interesting account about, uh, <clears throat> about Grace Bible Institute's role in, in Bethel and the competition probably between the two. Up until the founding of Grace, which would have been, what, eight, uh, 1947, something like that, Bethel used to publish all the donors on a monthly basis, even if it was only 25 cents or 50 cents or $5, and who, the donor and where they were from. But after Grace Bible Institute was founded, 
President Kaufman stopped that printing of the donor, donor list because he was afraid that Grace would then get ideas of creating their own donor list, and he didn't want to give them any help in that regard. So there was, there was competition there, yes. On the uh, academy, that was started the second year when I was at Bethel. I came in 1943, and so many men were drafted that there were only seven of us boys and 30 girls in that freshman class. And, uh, and so it was, uh, I think they said, they, let's start the academy so we can have more students here. I think that's right. We had the, we had the teachers, we had the space, and as I say, Gossel Hall was devoted to, uh, to, the, to the work of the uh, uh, academy. That's where the students were housed if they were uh, boarding students, and I'm not sure if that's where they had their classes, but uh, that, was, that was available. So there was excess space, and they were looking for new customers. And my parents saw to it that uh, several Cheyenne boys came to the academy at one time. There were three of them at one time. Okay. Well, thank you for all of your all of your support, and uh, I know I'm speaking to an audience that, that on many of these areas know more than I do. So uh, that's the challenge and that's the pleasure of talking about a topic like this to an audience like this. Thank you very much. I appreciate your comment. And remember that you can join us again for more uh, tomorrow at 11 at Convocation and then tomorrow evening at 7.30 and Tuesday evening at 7.30 for additional programs on Bethel history.